the guy pulling the parking lot and he, uh, the baby's not breathing, it doesn't look like. Hold on, my son does. I just watched a news report of a guy who, who did this, just like me. Before starting today's case, I want to say a huge thank you to Simply Safe for partnering with me on today's video. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Most parents try their absolute best to ensure the safety of their children. No parent wants to fall victim to horrible accidents like drownings, falling, or leaving a child in a hot car, all of which can be fatal to a young child. However, some parents in the darkest, most evil corners of the world will use these horrible situations to take their child's life, all to make it look like an accident when in reality, they are just a monstrous murderer. Today, we are going to be taking a look into a case where both situations are possible. I have my opinions, but after hearing the details of this case, I want to know what you all think. Is this father a murderer? or is he the victim of a horrible accident that can happen to anybody? But before we get into a case discussing one of the many dangers children can face, I wanna talk about one way that we can all keep ourselves and our children safe, and that is with Simply Safe. As so many of you may already know, I am so very passionate about personal protection, and one of the most effective ways to protect your safety is through home security. Throughout my life, there have been many times where I wished I had home security. Once when I was in high school, our house got broken into and they took my mom's car keys literally out of the kitchen and just stole her car from the driveway. Then this was actually a couple months ago, but there was one time where at like three in the morning, I woke up to my dog going nuts because somebody rang the doorbell. I was still in a groggy state at first, so I was like, what's going on? but then they rang the doorbell again. This really freaked me out, so I didn't answer, but I looked out a window in front of my house and saw that whoever was at my front door was not walking away. They were waiting there. I ended up calling the police and the person left by that point, but it really freaked me out and I wish I had some sort of home security to see who it was and if it truly was something sketchy. All I want in this life is to make sure my roommates and I, as well as our three dogs, are all safe within our home. And that is why I started using Simply Safe. Simply Safe is a comprehensive security system for the entire home with advanced sensors and cameras to detect threats like break ins, fires, floods, and more. They're a combination of sensors which can detect windows breaking, doors opening, and motion if there's someone outside or inside your home. They make me feel so much more at ease. Whether I'm at home and want to protect myself, or if I'm away and want to make sure my property and my pets are safe, I know that Simply Safe has my back. Simply Safe offers 24 7 live guard protection and the smart alarm indoor camera. If set off, Simply Safe's expert agents will act within five seconds of receiving the alarm signal. They will rapidly assess the situation and take immediate steps to ensure that you and your family are safe. Their agents can use the indoor camera to see and even speak to intruders in real time, stopping them in their tracks, which honestly, I think that has to be my favorite feature. I set up my Simply Safe system in my own home completely by myself. It was very easy to get set up and they provide very clear, simple, step-by-step -step instructions, but they do offer professional installation for those of you who prefer the expertise of a pro. The other thing I love about Simply Safe is that unlike traditional home security systems, Simply Safe never locks you into a long-term contract or charge hidden fees. Simply Safe earns your business day by day by keeping you safe and satisfied, never locking you in. Professional monitoring plans are available for less than $1 per day, which is less than half the cost of a traditional security system. Give yourself a sense of control and ease knowing that your home is protected no matter where you are. You can save 20% on your system and get your first month free when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring at simplysafe.com slash Rachel Shannon. Simply Safe is risk-free. If you don't love it, you can return it. So once again, visit simplysafe.com slash Rachel Shannon to save 20% plus get your first month free when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring. Thank you again so much to Simply Safe for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we will be discussing the tragic case of Cooper Harris. Justin Ross Harris was born and raised in the Tuscaloosa area in Alabama before going on to attend the University of Alabama. 
Around that time, Justin met his soon-to-be wife, Leanna Taylor. After graduating from school, the couple moved to Marietta, Alabama, where they settled down and had one child, a son named Cooper, born on August 2, 2012. According to those who knew Cooper, he was described as a happy baby. He loved to speak to anyone and was not shy by any means. He loved trucks and cars, and any time he was walking outside with his parents, he would wave bye-bye to the passing cars, saying bye-bye red car, bye-bye blue truck. He brought so much joy to the lives of everyone who knew him. By the morning of June 18th, 2014, Justin reports that Cooper woke up at around 5.15 a.m., so he brought Cooper into bed with him and Leanna, where Cooper fell back asleep while Justin laid awake on his phone. By 7.15 a.m., Leanna left for work while Justin and Cooper stayed home to get ready for their day. Cooper woke up again around the same time that Leanna left for work and played with his toys and watched cartoons until around 8 a.m. By 8.30 a.m., Justin and Cooper left the home, driving his Hyundai Tucson SUV, with Cooper sitting in his red rear-facing car seat located in the middle in the back seat. Justin was responsible for dropping Cooper off at the Little Apron Academy, which is Home Depot's in-house daycare center. This was something that Justin did every day when he went to work, but that morning, Justin said they were running a little bit late, so he decided to stop at Chick-fil-A for a daddy-son breakfast. The two arrived to the restaurant by 9 a.m. and stayed inside for about 20 minutes while they ate. Now, I want to note that stopping at Chick-fil-A was not unusual for Justin. In fact, he went there for breakfast regularly. However, he would typically drop Cooper off at daycare first because if he arrived before 8.45, they would feed Cooper breakfast. Even if Cooper was going to be late to daycare, Justin would usually call and ask the center if they could hold Cooper's breakfast, telling them that he would be late, and it never seemed to be any problem. Either that, or if Justin fed Cooper before daycare, he would still call and tell them not to worry about Cooper's breakfast. On a typical day, Justin would drop Cooper off and then head to Chick-fil-A by himself. However, on that morning, Justin took Cooper with him, but he also didn't call the daycare to let them know whether he needed breakfast or not. That part of this was very unusual. After eating, the two left the Chick-fil-A with Justin carrying Cooper out. At the time, Cooper was awake and alert, looking at the employees just being his normal, goofy little self. According to Justin, he then put Cooper in the car seat, gave him a kiss, and said, ready, let's go. After that, surveillance cameras from Cooper's work showed him arriving to the building at around 9.24 a.m. The Chick-fil-A was only about 0.6 miles away from his work, so it makes sense that it took him four minutes to arrive. After pulling into the space, he opened his door for about 20 seconds before stepping out and shutting the door behind him. He then walked into work, carrying a Chick-fil-A cup and his work bag. For the following hour and a half, Justin sat in work, responding to emails and looking into different cruise line ideas for an upcoming vacation he and Leanna were planning. By 11 a.m., one of Justin's coworkers asked the work group chat if they wanted to get lunch as they normally did. Justin said that he didn't want to go, but ultimately decided to get lunch, asking his coworkers to drive instead of him. Him and two others then went and got lunch at the local Publix. At that time, nothing about Justin or his behavior or mood appeared unusual or off. They stopped at a Home Depot on the way back from lunch so that Justin could grab a light bulb. After that, the coworker dropped Justin off at his car, and then once by his car, he opened the front passenger side door to toss the light bulb onto the front passenger seat. He then closed the door and walked away. He proceeded to go back up to his cubicle and returned working. By 3.16 p.m., Justin texted Leanna, asking her when she was picking Cooper up from daycare. Leanna texted about 45 minutes later, saying, Call me, are you not going home first? The two then spoke on the phone about who was going to be picking Cooper up, and eventually, Leanna agreed to grab him that day. By 4.50 p.m. on June 18th, Lana arrived to Little Apron to pick up 22-month-old Cooper, but when she got there, she learned that he had never been dropped off that day. Going back just a bit, by 4.16 p.m. on June 18th, Justin is seen on surveillance camera walking from his work building to his car before getting in and pulling away. 
According to Justin, he was going to the movies right after work, so that is where he was headed when he left work. As he was driving, he looked to his right to change lanes, and that is when he saw that little Cooper was still in the backseat of the car. He said he immediately pulled into the closest parking lot, which was around two miles away from work. Once in the parking lot, he jumped out and immediately went to the back and pulled Cooper out, lying him down on the pavement. According to witnesses in that parking lot, they heard Justin screaming, what have I done? And another heard him yell, I've killed my son. And a third witness heard him just ranting, saying, she's going to kill me. One witness said that they saw Justin fumbling around with Cooper. He was probably trying CPR or something, but obviously was not doing it correctly. So this witness moved Justin out of the way and started CPR on Cooper. But at that point, tragically, it was clear to the witness that Cooper was already dead. As that was happening, Justin walked away from Cooper and began pacing back and forth while on his phone. He would later say that he was trying to call Little Apron so they could tell Leanna where Cooper was. However, that was a bit odd because Leanna had her own phone and he could have contacted her directly. By 4.24 p.m., a witness at the scene called 911 with officers arriving shortly after. According to officers on scene, Justin was still pacing back and forth. He showed moments of being calm and on the phone, but then would randomly shriek or scream at the top of his lungs. He would also start yelling out of nowhere, and the way he was reacting overall was a bit odd to officers. At that point, officers asked Justin to identify himself, but he actually refused. He started yelling and arguing with the officer up until the point that he screamed to the officer to, quote, shut the F up, my son just died. The behavior was a little erratic. He was sitting in the back of the squad car alternately weeping or, or, or very distraught and then sort of looking around to see. In their mind, they felt like he was putting on a performance and not a very good one. One of the, the officers, the best she could describe it as, was almost like Will Ferrell. One minute he would be yelling, my boy, my boy. What have I done? Oh my God. Oh my God, what have I done? My boy. Next minute he's calm. After this escalation, officers cuffed him and put him into the back of the police car. After it seemed like Justin had calmed down, an officer spoke with him and asked him about what happened. He told the officer that he had forgotten to drop Cooper off at daycare and forgot to do a second look inside of the car before going into work. He kept saying, I swore I dropped him off. When crime scene technicians arrived on scene, they took a look inside of the car and saw his work bag and those light bulbs still sitting on the front passenger seat of the car. Upon opening the door, they were immediately hit with the strong odor of a hot, musty, urine-soaked diaper. Upon examining Cooper, it was discovered that he had an overfilled diaper with urine, so that is one thing that really stood out to them. The fact that the car smelled really bad of urine, yet Justin apparently didn't notice. Either way, after Justin spoke with detectives on the scene, the officer who originally put him in the back of the police car took him down to the police station for an interview. During that ride, Justin was trying to make some small talk, asking the cop how long she had been an officer, and things like that. Once again, this stood out to the officer because normally when someone's going through something so traumatic, such as finding your child dead in your car, the parent doesn't just want to chat. Once they got to the station, they took Justin into the interview room. At first, he was sitting by himself for around 15 minutes. While by himself, he appeared calm at first, but would have random bursts of yelling and screaming or labored breathing. After a few minutes, Justin started crying and saying, oh God, my boy, why? Once the interview actually started, Justin went back to appearing calm for the most part, but he would occasionally tear up when speaking about his son. He recounted the details of that day to the best of his ability. 
However, there were a few things he left out, such as getting lunch with his co-workers, stopping at Home Depot, and stopping back in his car to toss in those light bulbs. It was only after reviewing the CCTV footage from his work that police found out about these extra activities he did that day. He mentioned that his relationship with his wife was pretty good, beside the typical ups and downs that every relationship has. He told detectives that he was well aware of the significant dangers of leaving a kid in a hot car. He said that he has seen this happen on the news and knows that kids or dogs or any other living beings left in a hot car unattended can die from heat exposure. He said that it was his absolute worst fear to leave his son in a hot car like that. He maintained, though, that it was just a horrible accident, that he completely forgot to drop him off. He forgot that he was in the car until it was too late. He never would have left Cooper in that car intentionally. Driving on Acres Mill, I caught a glimpse of him in my, when I looked to my right to change lanes. I caught a glimpse of him in the back. I thought I'd saw it. I thought I was seeing things. And then I saw him. And then I lost him. I pulled in. I pulled him out. And then I, I for a few minutes, for I guess for what would seem like an eternity, but for just a few seconds, I attempted CPR. I, 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 I couldn't compose myself to do it, so another, there was a group there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure you got all their names. Um, and they attempted, and I just, I, I, I just, I saw him laying there. And he, just, he had that stare in his face. I knew he was gone. Did you take him out of the car seat? I did. Okay. And I knew, I just knew he was, I knew that I had done what every parent in their life fears they've done. And that's just leaving their son in the car on a hot day. And I lost it. I just started screaming. I started yelling. I, I screamed. I don't even remember what I yelled. I was just freaking out. Wow. How's your relationship with him? Fantastic. You have a really good relationship. We have just like I'm just like any normal relationship. You know, we've been married for over. Well, we've been married for eight years. Had our ups and downs like everybody else, but you know, I think we have a pretty healthy, strong relationship, mm -hmm. which we're about to find out if that's true or not. Explain to me how this happened. How do you, how do you think this happened? I have, there are occasions where in the morning after I drop him off, mm -hmm. I'll go to Chick fil A because it's, it's on the way. And uh, all those times, I'll always go to the drive thru. I never go inside by myself. And I'll leave Chick-fil-A, and when I turn out of Chick-fil-A, I'll turn on the Cumberland, mm -hmm. I'll take that U-turn, and I'll go straight to work. And I, just, I don't know if my mom just said, that's what you're doing today, so just go to work. So I would never leave him in car ride, right? so and I just watched news reports. There was a news report of a guy who, who did this, mm -hmm. just like me. And now he's an advocate for when you park, you turn around and look at you. 
and I've been doing that because the, the worst fear of, for, my, for me is to leave my son in a hot car. In the meantime, as I mentioned earlier, Leanna had gone to Little Apron to pick Cooper up only to realize he wasn't there. While there, Leanna was met with detectives who told her what happened. Of course, she was absolutely devastated. She said that she had always warned Justin about leaving their baby in the car like that. This exact situation was her worst nightmare. But at this time, police officers were not convinced that this was just a horrible accident. After that initial interview with Justin, he was arrested and charged with felony murder and cruelty to children. After Justin was arrested and charged, officers brought Leanna into the station and allowed her to speak with him in an interview room. When they spoke, Justin just cried and cried and told Leanna that it was just an accident. He said that he is comforted by the fact that Cooper is in heaven, saying that even if he could bring Cooper back, he wouldn't because he's in heaven. Now, after the discovery of Cooper's body, he was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The medical examiner found that Cooper died a slow, painful, traumatic death. He likely would have had an intense headache, nausea, anxiety, and likely had multiple seizures. He would have started struggling in his car seat more and more as the car slowly got hotter and hotter. Cooper was found to have multiple small abrasions on his head, arms, and legs, which were most likely the result of rubbing on hot surfaces, such as the hot plastic on the car seat. This likely would have been very painful for little Cooper. The medical examiner found that 22-month-old Cooper Harris died as a result of hyperthermia in that car. Absolutely horrific. Obviously, a lot of Justin's behaviors and statements have been concerning up to this point. Of course, police wanted to make sure that they had Justin in their custody while they investigated further to make sure that if they did find information that pointed towards this being an intentional homicide, then they already had Justin where they needed him. Once he was in their custody, police confiscated his phone and examined it, and what they found on that phone was very, very concerning and disturbing. First, investigators found that Justin had a habit of contacting young girls online, talking about sexually explicit things, exchanging photos, and meeting up for hookups. He would mostly use dating apps to find women or teenagers, or he would communicate with them on an app called Whisper. On the app, you can message back and forth with people. You can also respond to different posts made by various people. Justin was known to respond to all sorts of posts, including sexual and non-sexual subjects. Justin had been messaging with multiple women and teenage girls for at least a year and a half before Cooper's death. After identifying some of these women, they were interviewed by police. One of them is listed as CD in court documents. This was a 16-year-old girl who had been communicating with Justin since the fall of 2013. CD said that she disclosed her age to Justin very shortly after they started communicating, so he knew she was a minor. She would even talk to Justin about her high school classes and prom, so there was no question about her age whatsoever. She said that he was very, very pushy in his texts to her, asking her over and over and over again for her to send him pictures of her genital area. She refused to send these despite months of him asking, but he did send her multiple pictures of his own penis. He said all sorts of sexual things about what he wanted to do to her, once even saying he would do these things to her even if you said no. He then asked her multiple times to meet up with him, but I don't think they actually ever met up. Another girl he messaged with was a 15-year-old girl, MB. Now, initially, this young girl did tell Justin she was 18, and he responded with a dick pic, but shortly after they started talking, she admitted she was 15, but if you thought he stopped his messages after that, you would be wrong. He continued saying extremely graphic sexual things to her, mentioning her age specifically multiple times, saying she looked good for a 15-year-old and things like that. 
The message itself was way more sexual than that, but it's disgusting and I'm not repeating it. But just know that he was saying very graphic things and mentioning her age while saying those very graphic things. Then we have an 18-year-old, Molly, who started speaking with Justin in May of 2013. They exchanged sexual messages and spoke pretty much daily, but they never met up despite Justin asking her multiple times. However, she actually said that her and Justin had expressed their love for one another on multiple occasions. Justin told her that if the situation were different, if he weren't with Leanna, he would be with her. He would say that the only reason he was even with Leanna was because of Cooper. If it weren't for him, he'd leave his wife. She went on to say that Justin would frequently text her about how frustrating Cooper was and how irritated he got with him on a regular basis. Then there was a 19-year-old who started talking to Justin in the summer of 2013. They did eventually meet up and the two hooked up at Justin's home. Another was a 21-year-old woman who he had been messaging with since early 2014. The 21-year-old told investigators that back in February and April of 2014, the two met up and had sexual encounters in his car. Justin told her that he was having problems in the bedroom with his wife, but he didn't say he wanted to leave her necessarily. Other than this, in general, there were tons of posts and replies Justin made to Whisper where he talked about being a sex addict. He said he wanted a divorce. He said that he cheats a lot but he mentioned that he can't get a divorce because he has a kid. He said that the only reason he's still with his wife is for the sake of their kid. There were also other underage girls who never really got too deep into conversations with Justin, but there were lots of other sexual messages exchanged. For example, one 17-year-old said that Justin offered her $50 for him to come to her high school, and then she would give him oral in his car during lunch. Just gross. I don't think that ever actually happened and their messages weren't for too long, like they weren't messaging back and forth for that long, but obviously things escalated pretty quickly and he was making some really disturbing requests. Investigators also found over 800 searches on Google for things like escort services on Craigslist, Backpage, and numerous porn sites. He had hired sex workers at least three times times. Now continuing on with what was found on Justin's phone going forward with the timeline onto the morning of Cooper's death. As I stated earlier, Cooper woke up at around 5.15 a.m., so Justin grabbed him and brought him into the room with him, and he proceeded to stay on his phone for a few hours while Cooper and Leanna slept. At that time, he was sending messages to all sorts of different women online, most of the messages were sexual, talking about how they wanted to hook up and have sex. By 8 a.m. that morning, he messaged the 21-year-old saying that she could come by and give him oral that day. As he was getting Cooper loaded into the car and driving to Chick-fil-A, he responded to more posts and commented to multiple women about how great sex with them would be. By 8.55 a.m., shortly before walking into the Chick-fil-A, Justin responded to a post on Whisper saying, quote, I hate being married with kids. The novelty has worn off and I have nothing to show for it. I miss having time by myself and going out with friends. The person who made the post talked about how they were also unhappy with their two children who are just draining her. She said that she needs a break and Justin replied that he also needed a break. I do want to note that there were messages found between Leanna and Justin which showed that they did frequently have disagreements regarding him going out and seeing friends at the same time that Leanna also wanted to have a break and see her friends. So there was evidence that this was a point of contention within their relationship. Then while at work, it appears that Justin continued sending sexual messages back and forth all day. He got some nudes from the 17-year-old he was talking to, and the two had an intense sexual conversation for about an hour after that. He then messaged another woman. He sent her a nude, I guess from work, and he told this woman that he almost got oral that day, but then the girl got scared and ended up not doing it. The woman he was messaging at this point was a 23-year-old who had met up with Justin at least one time since late 2012, and they did hook up when they met. After that, the two messaged frequently, talking about very sexual things. 
at no point did Justin mention being married or having a child to this woman. Again, Justin was sending all of these sexual messages while still at work, sitting in his cubicle. As I mentioned earlier, he also went and got lunch with his coworkers and then got the light bulbs before stopping at his car to toss them in. I do want to note that the car was parked under a shady tree. According to experts, when Justin returned to the car, it would have been around 90 degrees inside. At that time, Cooper likely still would have been alive and very uncomfortable. It's likely that he would have been making some sort of noise or been crying to express his discomfort at the time. Imagine being in that car since the morning and you're getting hotter and hotter. No one's there to save you. No one's coming and opening the door. If you finally hear that door open, you're probably going to yell. You're probably going to start crying. You're probably going to start screaming for your parent. Even if you are as young as Cooper was, that's just instinctual. My dog literally does that. If he's by himself for a while in his little area and then I walk in the house, he hears me and he's like, oh my gosh, my mom's home and starts barking. A child is going to do the same thing, especially if they're in a car alone and very uncomfortable. They're going to start crying and begging the parent to take them out of the car, but apparently Justin didn't see him or hear anything. After lunch, by around 1 p.m., the car would have reached 100 degrees, and by 3.30 p.m., the car would have been 125 degrees at its hottest. Now, with all of these sexual messages investigators found, with Justin clearly cheating, not being happy with his current situation, and doing everything he possibly could to hook up with other women and underage girls, police spoke with Leanna to see what she knew. And Leanna said that she was not aware of most of this. She did know that he had a problem with pornography and found one message a few years back where Justin was asking a girl for nudes. They went to therapy for this, but obviously it didn't seem to work. Again, even though she knew Justin had a problem, she had no idea just how bad the problem was. In addition to the sexually explicit Google searches and conversations, police also found that both Justin and Leanna had done searches for hot car-related deaths just before Cooper's death. Justin also made searches for things like how to survive prison, what is prison really like, he was also participating in various subreddits relating to being child-free and the benefits of not having kids. Based on all of the information that I've told you up to this point, the prosecution was more confident than ever that Justin murdered his baby. By September 4th, 2014, Justin was indicted for charges of malice murder, two counts of felony murder, cruelty to children, criminal attempt to commit a felony, and six counts of sending harmful materials to minors. He was also later charged with two counts of sexual exploitation of children. To these charges, Justin pleaded not guilty. He was unable to post his bail, so he did await his trial in jail. Then, as he awaited his trial, by February 11, 2016, Leanna filed for divorce from Justin. Then, finally, by October 4, 2016, Justin's trial for the murder of his baby son, Cooper, started. The prosecution argued that Justin intentionally and maliciously left Cooper in that car to die because he wanted to live a child-free life, divorce Leanna, and be free to pursue any sexual relationships he wanted with as many women as he wanted. They supported their claims by discussing all of those sexual messages and posts on Whisper that investigators found many of which included him saying that he wishes he didn't have a son and he would leave his wife if it weren't for Cooper. They talked about all of Justin's suspicious behaviors from that day, including not calling the daycare like he normally did in the morning. Then, after going to Chick-fil-A and going to work, he actually parked in a spot farther away from the entrance to his work than where he normally parked. This may be because he wanted less people to walk by his car. Now, I will note that the employees weren't assigned parking and Justin would change around where he parked, but he normally parked as close to the entrance as possible as most people would, but on that particular day, he parked a lot farther away. Then, as I mentioned earlier, after work, Justin reported that he was gonna be going to the movies. It was reported that Justin seemed to have taken a congested and longer route to the movie theater after work. There was a much easier way to go with much less traffic, but 
for whatever reason, he chose the busier, more congested route. Some people believe that he did this on purpose so he could choose a more busy parking lot to ensure that there would be a witness who saw him freaking out and trying to save his boy's life. One of the witnesses at the scene said that although Justin appeared distraught, his demeanor was sort of switching back and forth between looking upset and then being relatively calm and collected. The witness said that he expected more tears and more hysteria from Justin, but that isn't what he saw. However, the witness did say on cross-examination that obviously he didn't know Justin personally, so there's no way to know for sure how he should have or would have reacted to trauma like this, because again, as we know, everyone reacts differently to trauma. But Justin's fluctuations in his reaction was something that stood out to many people who interacted with him that day, including law enforcement. All of this information points to the possibility that Justin planned the murder of his son to make it look like an accident, all so that he could go about his life having sex with whoever he wanted and not having to be tied down by a wife and kid. The medical examiner also testified about the slow, painful, excruciating death that Cooper suffered. He died slowly, struggling more and more as the car got hotter and hotter. But as this was being testified, Justin seemed to show no emotion. On the other hand, the defense argued that all of this was just a horrible, horrible accident. Leanna actually testified for the defense saying that yes, Cooper was the world's shittiest husband, but he was a loving, doting father. He never would have hurt his son and she truly believes that this was an accident. Others, including Cooper's daycare teachers, family members, and co-workers, all said that Justin was a loving, caring father to Cooper. There was no evidence that Justin had ever abused or neglected Cooper in any way previously. Nothing to show that he wanted his son out of his life. Then, an expert on perspective memory took the stand in Justin's defense. He explained that perspective memory is memory of a goal, remembering what you're going to do next. This is counter to routine behavior, which just sort of happens. Despite this being a daily routine, the expert argued that Justin going to work was a routine while dropping Cooper off, that is perspective memory. Oftentimes, when someone's distracted due to fatigue, maybe they're under stress or thinking about external events, they can forget their perspective goal, causing them to just go about their routine and forget what they were supposed to do, i.e. going to work but skipping the step that involves dropping Cooper off. This happens all the time to people, obviously to a less extreme degree, such as maybe forgetting to reply to an important email because you're distracted by other things going on in your life. So even though you got up, you got ready, you sat down, you went to work, you're at your desk, you forget about that one task that you were supposed to do because of everything else going on. When this happens, sometimes different cues can trigger a person to remember, such as someone mentioning Cooper to him at work or Leanna asking about him. However, this doesn't always work because sometimes people will create false memories. It's possible that Justin thought all day that he dropped Cooper off, so even though Leanna and him talked about Cooper, even though Justin visited his car halfway through the day and might have heard Cooper, it just didn't register to him because he might have created a false memory where he really thought that he dropped Cooper off that day. Then it was said that the route to get to work from the Chick-fil-A was very similar to the one you used to get to daycare. You make the same right turn out of the parking lot, you go down the same main road, and then you make a U-turn onto that next road. However, with getting to work, the building was right down that street that he made a U-turn on, but to get to daycare, you had to make a left turn onto another street before making it to that daycare. According to the memory expert, that U-turn could have been enough to distract Justin and cause him to forget that extra turn to drop Cooper off. They also brought up that Justin had been involved with an extra project at work, so he was already tired and stressed from that, so everything could have affected him to the point where he simply forgot Cooper in the car. At the end of the trial, both sides made their closing arguments. The prosecution was adamant that Justin did this on purpose and tried to make it look like an accident, 
all so he could live a child-free life and have sex with whoever he wanted. The defense said that this was all an accident and that Justin was a loving, doting father. After that, the jury of six men and six women went off for deliberations, and in the end, they found that Justin Ross Harris is guilty on all counts relating to his son's death, including malice murder and felony murder. Ma'am, is that correct? Have you, in fact, arrived at a verdict? Yes, sir. If you will hand it to the bailiff, the bailiff will bring the verdict to me for my review. In the Superior Court of Cobb County, State of Georgia, State of Georgia versus Justin Ross Harris, defendant, case number 4093124, verdict form. We, the jury, find as follows Count one, malice murder. As to count one, we define we find the defendant guilty. Count two, felony murder. As to count two, we find the defendant guilty. To this, the judge sentenced Justin to life in prison plus 34 years. Court pronounces the following sentence in the case of the state of Georgia versus Justin Ross Harris. As to count one, the court imposes the sentence of as to malice murder, uh, with the jury having found the defendant guilty. Sentence of the court is life to serve in confinement without parole. As to count four, cruelty to children in the first degree. Uh, the jury having found the defendant guilty. The sentence of the court is 20 years to serve in confinement. This will be consecutive to count one, malice murder, life to serve in confinement without parole. Count five, cruelty to children in the second degree. It will merge into count four as a matter of law. As to count six, criminal attempt to commit a felony to wit, sexual exploitation of children. The court imposes a sentence of 10 years to serve in confinement, consecutive to counts one and four. As to count seven, dissemination of harmful material to minors, with the jury having found the defendant guilty, the court imposes a sentence of 12 months to serve in confinement, consecutive to counts one, four, and six. And as to count eight, Dissemination of harmful material to minors, the jury having found the defendant guilty. The court imposes a sentence of 12 months to serve in confinement, consecutive to counts 1, 4, and uh, 6, and 7. However, after this conviction, Justin appealed his sentence, and this appeal made it all the way to the Georgia Supreme Court. The argument was made that all of the evidence regarding his affairs and having relations with other women outside of his marriage should not have been allowed in trial. They basically said that this evidence told the jury that he was a pervert and a sexual predator, but it didn't actually answer the question of whether Cooper was left in that car intentionally. Therefore, the jury was skewed in their opinions of Justin, leading them to find him guilty mostly because they thought he was an immoral, vulgar man, not necessarily because the evidence showed that he did this on purpose. The Supreme Court reviewed the appeal and they agreed. The Georgia Supreme Court stated that the evidence of his sexual crimes against minors had an unfair prejudicial impact on the jurors. Again, basically saying that the jury didn't like him for sexting minors, so they just assumed that he must have murdered his son without considering the actual evidence. They said that the evidence of whether this was intentional or not was underwhelming and it was not enough to convict him of murder. Because of this, by June 6, 2022, Justin's murder sentence was overturned. Instead, he will only be left with charges of the sexual crimes against minors, and for that, he will still serve 12 years behind bars. After the sentence was overturned, the Cobb County DA's office reviewed the case once again, and by May 25, 2023, they announced that they will not be retrying the murder case. They said that the crucial evidence used in the first trial is no longer available to be used per the Supreme Court's decision. Without this evidence, there will not be enough to get a conviction, so they are not going to be retrying Justin. Which I think this is all just such a huge slap in the face to baby Cooper. I think that based on everything we saw, I absolutely think that him messaging minors, him messaging all of these other women, and him wanting to have affairs outside of his marriage, I think that absolutely is evidence that should be used because it obviously shows a motive. I don't understand how that decision was made. He literally was talking to other people about wanting to be childless. He told multiple women and teenagers that he wanted to break up with Leanna, but he couldn't because he had a son. 
I don't see how that and him having these affairs is prejudicial in terms of not showing a motive because yes, it does make him less likable because he is a pervert. He is a predator but it also shows a motive. With that being said, I do think he did this on purpose. I think all of those messages with the other women and him having these affairs, they do point towards him wanting out of the relationship and it does point towards a motive. The biggest thing to me though is that he literally went to his car at lunch and opened the door and put the light bulbs inside. It's totally possible that he didn't look inside and see his son but I absolutely think he would have heard his son if he was still alive and he just ignored it. Also, his odd behaviors afterwards. Again, I get that everyone responds differently to trauma, but so many people, including law enforcement, said that the way he was acting was not how someone would normally act in this type of situation. And again, I do think Justin's sexual deviancy points towards his personality. And again, I think it had every right to be included in trial, not just because of the motive. Because the thing is, is that everyone around him thought that he was this nice guy who was social and outgoing and totally normal. But these messages show clear as day that he is not the person that he appears to be. I think that it's a big deal when we are considering what he is capable of. Him having all of those character witnesses saying that he's such a good person didn't know about these messages as they were happening. Obviously, they knew about them at the trial, but as they were happening, as they were interacting with him and he was acting totally normal and friendly and social towards them, they had no idea that he was being this disgusting pervert behind a screen. Some of you may think that texting minors isn't that big of a deal because they're 16 or 17, they're not 10, but let me tell you, those messages he was sending were nasty. The court documents I read did include those messages, but I didn't want to feel them out loud because even just reading them in my head made me feel gross. That is how bad they were. Those messages were disgusting. And again, they were sent to 15, 16, 17 year olds who aren't even out of high school yet. Again, people who know him can think all of the most positive things about him and think that this had to be an accident. But at the end of the day, the evidence shows that he is not the person even his closest friends and family thought he was. But that's what I think. And now I'm so curious to hear what you all think. Do you think Justin murdered his baby boy or do you think it truly was an accident? What do you think of the conviction being overturned? And do you think the sexual messages should have been admitted as evidence in trial or do you agree that it was prejudicial? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.